Well, hello, church history friends. My name is Barb Walden, and it is a joy to welcome you tonight to the Stories of the Scattered Saints Fall 2022 Lecture Series. Now, joining me tonight are two fantastic co-hosts, Peter Smith and Seth Bryant. Peter is taking care of all the behind the scenes magic that comes along with an online lecture. He serves as a board member for the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation and as a co-host of our Historic Sites bus tours. Seth is our official host this evening as he will be introducing our guest historian. Seth is the former site director at the Kirtland Temple He's the author of a number of articles in the John Whitmer Journal and Restoration Studies, in addition to once serving as the editor of the Restoration Studies. So thank you both for uh, joining us this evening and for contributing. Well, this lecture series is not only a great way to learn church history, it's also an opportunity to help support church heritage. Donations received during the lecture series will go to developing new educational programs, It'll help fund the Alma Blair Internship Program and support the ongoing maintenance and preservation of all five Community of Christ historic sites. Peter will drop the online donation link and mailing address into the chat for anyone who wishes to make a donation tonight. Thank you, friends, for your generous support. With that said, I will hand things over to Seth to introduce our guest speaker and share with us a little bit about what to expect tonight. Hi, Seth. Hi, Barb. Thank you. And good evening to everyone. So Peter is dropping the schedule for today's program in the chat to give you a better idea of what to expect over the next hour. We always look forward to your questions. Make sure that you enter those questions into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we'll go over those at the end of the presentation. All right, our guest historian tonight is Daniel P. Stone. Dr. Stone holds a PhD in American history from Manchester Metropolitan University in the United Kingdom. He is the author of William Bickerton, Forgotten Latter-day Prophet, Signature Books 2018. Uh, he currently works as a research archivist for a private library archive in Detroit, Michigan. The title of tonight, today's lecture is The Rocky Road to Prophethood, William Bickerton's Emergence as an American Prophet. Daniel, super excited to have you here. Spotlight is all yours. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me, Seth. And thank you guys so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. So I'm coming to you from fairly sunny Michigan, which I can't believe it's fall and it's still sunny. So I'm very excited to, to have that because I'm originally from Florida. So the fact that we have so much sun this late in the year is really nice. So I'm going to share my screen here. And okay, so today we're gonna to be talking about William Bickerton's emergence as an American prophet. And yes, it was very rocky because he was a poor English immigrant. He was not the person you would think that would take over a Latter-day Saint movement. He did not know Joseph Smith personally. Uh, he barely knew Signe Rigdon. I mean, so, and now his church that he started is the third largest Latter-day Saint church in the world. So how on earth did this happen? I think this is one of the coolest stories of the Latter-day Saint movement. And it kind of goes to show you the, I think the, the really rich uh, gospel that Joseph Smith had started, right? That anybody, it was very inclusive. And I think William Bickerton is a testament to that, along with so many others that started their own branches of the restoration. So without further ado, we'll jump right into it. And um, let's see here. I'll hit play. There we go. Okay, so we all know what happens on June 27th, 1844, right? Joseph Smith is murdered in cold blood with his brother and a few others. And in that situation, we have this, the beginning of the schisms, right, for the most part. And where was Sidney Rigdon at the time? I think this is a very interesting story because Sidney Rigdon, he was not there. And who knows, he could have very well have been in that room if he was there when they were all arrested. The interesting story about Sidney Rigdon was he was in Pennsylvania at the time when Joseph Smith was murdered because he... There was two reasons why Joseph Smith had this prophecy that he, it was quote sooner or later my servant Sidney will go to Pennsylvania, and then also Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon were resonating for the presidency. So it's just politically prudent most of the time to have your political running mate be in another state. And because Sidney Rigdon was originally from Pennsylvania and he had lived there in the past, he decided to go there to establish residency again. It's not a law 
that you have to be in two separate states. But again, it just looks more politically beneficial when you have two people representing it. So it was politically motivated as well why Sidney Rigdon was there. So what ends up happening is he finds out a few weeks later about Joseph Smith being murdered and he rushes back to Nauvoo. And he basically believes, okay, I'm the first counselor of the church. I therefore am going to be the president of the church, right? And, and he, we all kind of know that there was this climactic clash between Sidney Rigdon and Brigham Young, and they both want the presidency or they want to both lead the church. So they both agree that they're going to have this debate you know, right outside, right outside the Nauvoo Temple in the Grove. And a bunch of people show up, you know, thousands of people show up. Many of them are English immigrants that had recently moved to Nauvoo and that were converted, you know, under, under Brigham Young's tutelage. So it was not looking good for Sidney Rigdon. And it didn't help Sidney Rigdon that he also gave an hour and a half lecture as to why he wanted to be the president of the church. Now, granted, he was the first counselor. He definitely had a stake to that. However, Brigham Young argued that not necessarily that he would be the president, but that the 12 would lead it. So Joe, Sidney Rigdon thought that he had, he, he believed that he had this, um, this vision before he left to go to Nauvoo, that he would be a spokesperson unto the Lord for Joseph, because basically Joseph, when he died, according to Sidney Rigdon's speech, he took the keys with him of the kingdom. And Joe, and basically Sidney Rigdon had to be his mouthpiece until Joseph Smith came back, you know, kind of like this millennialist idea where Brigham Young had a much more, I guess you would say logical um, argument where he basically said, no, it's the 12 that are gonna lead the church. If Joseph Smith took the keys, where are your keys? I mean, kind of mocked uh, Sidney Rigdon a little bit. Also after an hour and a half of Sidney Rigdon talking, Brigham Young was very politically savvy. He broke for lunch, he let people eat, and then he gave his side of the, ca the side of the case. But then they ended up putting it up to a vote. They gave it to the membership to decide. It was based on common consent. And almost unanimously, there were a few detractors, but for the most part, most of the people decided to side with Brigham Young, not Sidney Rigdon. And eventually, what ended up they ended up deciding, you know, anybody who was for Sidney Rigdon and you know was very vocal about it, they would be excommunicated. So it was obviously was rocky. So what happens? Well, Sidney Rigdon runs back to Pennsylvania, right? He's a spokesman unto Joseph and the Lord, he still believes, and he's gonna start the true succession of the church. So he creates again the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He starts a newspaper called the Latter-day Saint Messenger and Advocate. Sounds familiar. It's the newspaper that they started in Kirtland, Ohio, right? So Sidney Rigdon is basically trying to go back to a more, I guess you would say, primitive version of the church that was under Joseph Smith, basically going back to the Ohio days, the early days. And in this newspaper, if anybody ever gets a chance to read it, it's absolutely fascinating. He basically has two missions to have this newspaper. It's to expose polygamy. Now that might sound like a shock to some people because, but Sidney Rigdon from the very beginning knew Joseph Smith was practicing polygamy. He didn't know right away, of course, because it was secret. How he finds out is that his daughter, Nancy is proposed by Joseph Smith. And then obviously she declines and he finds out about it. And we don't know exactly what happens, but accord, according to some of the primary sources, we at least know that Sidney Rigdon confronts Joseph about the polygamy situation. Joseph Smith at first denies it, but Sidney Rigdon presses him on it because he knows because of the situation with his daughter. And basically he gets to supposedly Joseph Smith kind of repents or says that he wasn't a, he didn't want to do it anymore. And Sidney Rigdon's like, listen, we'll let all, bygones be bygones. If you don't do this anymore, we'll just, I'll keep the secret and we'll just kind of go from there or we'll just keep it at, at bay. So they've had the, they had this very intense talk, and they obviously weren't talking to each other for a long time. This really kind of caused a wedge in between their relationship, but eventually it gets smoothed out towards the end. You know, especially with the nice thing about the Joseph Smith Papers project is we always kind of thought Sidney Rigdon was on the outs, you know, all the way up to Joseph Smith's death. But according to those papers, you really see they really weren't. Things had smoothed over, but in, as far as Sidney Rigdon was concerned, polygamy wasn't being practiced anymore. But we know from recent scholarship that wasn't true. So then he finds out, oh my gosh, they have been practicing polygamy. It was all behind my back. So he goes to expose polygamy. 
And even though the church at this time is actually saying, no, we're not practicing polygamy, all throughout this newspaper, you see him blaming Joseph Smith and Brigham Young for practicing polygamy. Something really interesting. And there's also this idea of a choice seer. Something that, you know, we often don't focus on in Latter-day Saint history is these millennialist ideas, but it's, it's, it's embedded within the theology of Latter-day Saint uh, history and within the theology is this idea that there was going to be a choice here that was going to rise up as the Book of Mormon talks about kind of like this new Moses that would gather Israel right for Zion. Joseph Smith was supposed to be the choice seer and was supposed to finish the gathering, but he dies, right? So who's going to be the new choice seer? Well, Signe Rigdon argues in the newspaper that that is him. Because Joseph Smith died, and he argues the reason Joseph Smith died, one of the big reasons was is that Joseph Smith started practicing polygamy. So therefore, God basically allowed him to be killed. And now he's the new choice here, and he's going to gather Israel. And he's going to do it in Pennsylvania. So this is where William Bickerton comes into play, right? He's an English immigrant. He had moved to Limetown, Pennsylvania. He had come to the States from Northumberland County in uh, England. He arrives in the United States in New York. He eventually moves to West, well, what is now West Virginia. Back then it was still Virginia. It was all one state. And he's, he basically, you know, followed the, through word of mouth. He was a coal miner in, New, in England and there's coal mines in Wheeling. And that's where he eventually goes to. And then he hears about the bustling city of Pittsburgh, right? I mean, one of the, the, one of the uh, hallmarks of Pittsburgh was the smoke that would basically cover the area because of the mills that they had and the, and the coal mines that they would have. So he goes there for better prospects. He is recently married, has a son, a little son. And, you know, he has a rough life. I mean, most immigrants back then do. I mean, he's a coal miner. He's working super long hours, working weekends for very little money. Eventually, he'll become a coal foreman, but you don't really make much money doing that as well. And in the end, he's trying to provide for his family. You can understand it's a rough life. And he hears these stories of Signe Rigdon preaching outside of Pittsburgh, because that's where Signe Rigdon's at with his church. And he must have read it from the local newspapers. Several of the local newspapers covered, you know, what was going on with Signe Rigdon. It was kind of hot news, right? With the murder of Joseph Smith and now his first counselor is here, you know, exposing things. So he goes there to hear. And according to William Bickerton, he basically listened to Signe Rigdon. And he writes later on in his life, he said that Signe Rigdon was the best order he had ever heard in classing the scriptures together. And he believed that he had the power of God. And he had been looking for that. He was a Methodist at the time. And he just felt like Methodism was not giving him what Signe Rigdon was offering from the Gospels because Signe Rigdon was preaching miracles, right? Baptism of the Holy Spirit, healings, speaking in tongues, having visions and dreams. Methodism in early America did believe in some of those things, especially visions and dreams. But, you know, as it as becomes a more vested organization, like most religions, you know, that, char that charisma or that charismatic uh, religion kind of sometimes goes underneath, you know, to the undergrounds. And that's kind of what happened with Methodism. And apparently Bick Bickerton believed in that and liked that. And this is what Sidney Riggin is offering him. So he joins the church in June, 1845, he gets baptized um, and he quickly becomes an elder. And then he becomes a 70. And then later on, he becomes a prophet, priest, and king. Because again, as we were saying, uh, Sidney Rigdon is kind of instituting again, like the school of the prophets, just like Joseph Smith had in Kirtland. This idea of a prophet, priest, and king was because, you know, in the book of Revelation, it says that we will be kings and priests unto the Lord in, you know, in the millennium or in Zion, right? So Sidney Reagan's just kind of getting things rolling the same exact way that, you know, Joseph Smith had, because, you know, when he ordained Signe Rigdon, he wasn't just a first counselor, he was also a prophet, seer, and revelator. And that's the other interesting thing, too, is that Signe Rigdon believed he was the last surviving prophet, seer, revelator out of the, you know, out of the presidency. And Brigham Young did not have that ordination. And this is what Bickerton would have understood and would have believed in. So again, he's being ordained the prophet, priest, and king. He's part of the grand council that Signe Rigdon starts. So long story short, he is in a prominent position. He actually, good, interesting tidbit, William Bickerton replaces William McClellan in the council, the Grand Council of Sidney Reading, because William McClellan eventually leaves, and William Bickerton was the one that replaced him in the in that Grand Council. So pretty interesting stuff. So there was some brush ups. Bickerton did have some connections, but you know nothing like you know Joseph Smith III or James Strang or some of these other people who knew Joseph Smith and the early saints. But very quickly, Joe, you know Bickerton is going to become discontented, right? Because 
if you are the new choice here, as Sidney Rigdon believed, you got to build the new Jerusalem. So he's looking, where is he going to do that? It can't be in Pittsburgh, right? It's a bustling city. So not too far outside of Pittsburgh in the Cumberland Valley, uh, there was a farm that Sidney Rigdon had found, and it was called Adventure Farm. And basically the church buys it. And they, he believes that this is where they are going to create the new Jerusalem and they're going to build their city. And in the School of the Prophets under Sidney Rigdon, William Bickerton was a part of that. And obviously, you know, that's where they learn, you know, they're learning different languages, they're reading books of like history and literature, other things, but they're also praying, they're practicing, you know, um, rituals like washing of feet, things like that. And according to William Bickerton, they even like spoke in tongues in there and had revelations and things like that under uh, Sidney Rigdon. And believe it or not, Bickerton very quickly is becoming a kind of like a maverick within uh, Sidney Rigdon's Church of Christ, eventually it's called, because again, he goes back to that name, the original name, that church, you know, that was called in, uh, in New York and in Ohio. And anyways, he's having these revelations in the School of the Prophets that Sidney Rigdon is going awry, and, and William Bickerton is not the only one in the School of Prophets that are having these revelations. And Sidney Rigdon kind of gets wind of this. So it's interesting because in, a, uh, in one of their... Uh, conferences, Rigdon actually calls out the, the Mavericks. He doesn't call them out by name, but he very kind of like almost like kind of what you see in the news, like with Putin or something, you know, like calls out like the people that are against him in these very kind of like broad strokes. And he's very angry. And William Bickerton was actually in that meeting when he's calling them out and he's saying that, hey, we're going to move to this, you know, we're going to move to this, uh, uh, adventure farm in the Cumberland Valley and create the new Jerusalem. And it's interesting because in the newspaper, they actually get William Bickerton's comments on the, like, what did you think of the conference? And the thing that he writes, according to the newspaper, it says that all that William Bickerton says is like, you know, something along the lines of like, I've always had the Holy Spirit with me in this church or some along those lines. So I've kind of always taken that. Now, of course, this is speculative, but he didn't actually say like, oh yeah, it was a great conference. It was awesome. I loved everything that Rigdon had to say. He was basically saying, I've had the Holy Spirit this whole time. So you know that he doesn't agree with what's going on because not very long after that, everybody kind of moves out there it, 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 or a good chunk of the, the congregation moves out there. And Bickerton is not the one that moves out there with them. And he's, again, he's in this, this prominent position and he does not go. So he, very early on, we know that he doesn't agree with everything. And Rigdon obviously was having some failed prophecies. Like in this conference, he based, or early on, he has this revelation that, you know, people within the church had to give like everything they possibly could for, you know, to, to create the new Jerusalem to the widow's might, to those who have thousands, he said, you know, please give to the church. And it was expected of them. And of course it doesn't work. You know, at one point there's this meeting where Signe Rigdon believes like, you know, you know, like thing, he believes that he's seeing like these, these uh, angelic figures, people from the old Testament and the, in the Bible, he thinks that, you know, he's going to save his church and it never comes to pass. So there, you start to see these little glimmers of Signe Rigdon and kind of what's going on. And even also, there's speculation. This is all speculation because we really don't know what was going on in Signe Rigdon's head. But even his son, John Wycliffe Rigdon, later on, who ends up joining the LDS church, he says, you know, my father, you know, he was sane on every subject. But once he got onto religion, he, he, he started to lose himself. And he's talking about uh, Signe Rigdon in his old age. So who really knows why Signe Rigdon had these, but he was very, um, he was very charismatic and he kind of sometimes would lose himself in that charisma of these religions. So William Bickerton is seeing all this, but long story short, not long after, obviously they go to the new Jerusalem or they go where they want to do the new Jerusalem it, very quickly. They're not, you know, they're not producing what they should be. You know, they need to produce, they need to producing uh, like, like, you know, like like mills, you know, they have cotton mills, things like that to kind of get a city going and they're just not doing it. Very quickly, it goes bankrupt. And William Bickerton from the very beginning kind of knew that this was going to happen or felt this was going to happen. And so he's staying in Pittsburgh and a lot of people lost a ton of money, lost their livelihoods when the new, uh, the, the new Jerusalem and the Cumberland Valley completely fails. And William Bickerton actually talks about that some of the bankrupt Rigdonites actually came to see him in Pittsburgh and kind of saw him. And he kind of, I mean, as a poor English anchorman, he's financially trying to help them out. He's emotionally trying to help them out. And he just kind of realizes like, man, this man that I really believed in kind of fell away. 
but he never gives up his belief in the Book of Mormon. And now he's trying to like kind of care for these people who've lost everything and Vicar, you know, and Rigdon's um, failed attempt to create the New Jerusalem. So it's a it's a rough road to be. So what's he gonna do, right? Well, this is when he starts investigating Brigham Young because. He's basically asking himself, did Sidney Rigdon tell the truth about Brigham Young? When you read The Messenger and Advocate that Sidney Rigdon published in Pittsburgh, it was just filled with anger towards Brigham Young, that Brigham Young was a polygamist, that Brigham Young was corrupting the church, that Brigham Young was not the rightful successor, on and on and on. So he starts to say to himself, well, Sidney Rigdon completely failed. And what's Brigham Young? You hear about the stories. They literally create this oasis in the middle of the Utah desert, right? They, they're creating a city. Newspapers in America are writing about them, that this strange religion with this strange leader is still prospering. What was supposed to die when Joseph Smith died is prospering. I mean, shoot, they're finding, you know, some of the Mormons, they're finding gold and the gold, gold is filling the coffers of the church. I mean, this is very interesting news. So he's hearing about these things. He's seeing the prosperity of Brigham Young. And he's also seeing the political and social turmoil that is happening within the United States at the time. Obviously, late 1840s and the early 1850s, America is rife with division. I mean, we think we're divisive now. It's nothing like it was in the 1850s. It was horrible. And it's not just states' rights. At the core of every state right is this issue of slavery, right? It's kind of both. And there's this issue with it where the, the states are constantly trying to fight over each, over each other of, you know, how much power should the federal government have? Where are states to be, supposed to be allowed? You, you know, the Compromise of 1850, you have the Fugitive Slave Act, right? Like where you have to, if a slave escapes to the North, you have to send them back. I mean, it's really, really contentious. So, and what's interesting is you might say, well, what does this have to do? Well, you have to understand this has to do everything with the millennialist theory of Latter-day Saint theology, as we're all well aware. And they believe that there's this destruction that's supposed to come upon America, like the Book of Mormon talks about, right? And this is where I feel like Brick Bickerton and Sidney Rigdon and Brigham Young, they all believe the same idea. It comes from Joseph Smith's Civil War prophecy. Joseph Smith had this prophecy in 1832 during the succession crisis under Andrew Jackson, and basically this idea that like, you know, that, that, that there was going to be this civil war, that South Carolina was going to secede from the Union, and that the, the slaves were going to rise up against their masters, that the Native Americans were going to rise up, and that the country was going to be thrown into a bloody war. And then eventually this war would cover to the rest of the world, and then that would kind of like be the destruction, right? So both. Sidney, Sidney Reagan actually talked about Joseph Smith's Civil War prophecy in his newspaper. So that's how Bickerton would have, heard, would have heard about it. Brigham Young talks about it too, believes in it, and sees all these things, turmoils. Bickerton's seeing this. So he has the same idea. So he writes to, in 1850 to Canesville, Iowa, which is you know, basically winter quarters. It's, it's, the, it's the Iowa side of winter quarters. And he basically writes to them saying, hey, I want to know more, more about the church. Obviously, he doesn't send the letter to Salt Lake City because Mail back then was not very good. So he's keeping it more close towards civilization and he hopes to hear something back. Well, what ends up happening is eventually word does get out that J Bickerton's uh, letter does get to Canesville. And there are these two missionaries that are in the East at the time, John Murray and David James Ross in 1851, get correspondence back to say, hey, go visit this guy, William Bickerton. He has these congregants, these few congregants around him, and they're trying to find a church. You know, they're they're uh, malcontents from, you know, Sidney Rigdon's re failed religious experiment, right? So they go visit William Bickerton and they talk to him and they say, okay, you know, let's hash this out. You know, let's talk about the church and let's see what you believe in. Well, first things first, Bickerton wants to know, are you guys practicing polygamy? Because that's what I was always told under Sidney Rigdon. John Murray and David James Ross both tell William Bickerton, of course not, we're not practicing polygamy. So William Bickerton's like, oh my gosh, Sidney Rigdon was lying, okay? But they have a lot of similarities, right? It's not exactly the same, but there are a ton of similarities. They believe that the second coming of Jesus Christ is imminent. They believe that the gathering of Israel is continuing. And obviously, it's just under Brigham Young, and it, you know, it's and the, the 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 core of that is in Utah, right? And there's this idea of the choice here, right? Like Joseph Smith was supposed to be the choice here, but he dies. Then Sidney Rigdon says he's the choice here. Well, he, his experiment completely fails. So who's this new choice here? William Bickerton, it doesn't really say one way or the other what he believes in. We'll kind of get into what he eventually believes in later. 
eventually the Bickerton's going to believe it's a Native American prophet that's going to rise up out of the Native Americans, and that's going to be the choice here. And interesting enough, David Whitmer believed that too later on when he was older. So Bickerton was not the only one to kind of come up with that theory. But eventually, even regardless if Bickerton is having this idea or not early this on, again, the similarities are very similar. They both believe in the Bible. They both believe in the Book of Mormon. They both believe in the Book of Moses at the time or what they had of the Book of Moses. Because again, Signe Rigdon had published a lot of this stuff in his newspaper. So William Bickerton would have been familiar with a lot of these writings that happened under Joseph Smith. So all these differences, these minor little differences, basically the, the missionaries tell Bickerton, these are reconcilable differences because, right, like every member in the church might have different ideas about like the end times, right? But as long as Bickerton could accept that the prophetic mantle had transferred from Joseph Smith to Brigham Young, that's really all they needed to know because everything else is pretty much the same. And Bickerton agrees with that, obviously, because Sidney Rigdon went awry. So the prophetic mantle, he agrees, has now gone to Brigham Young. They're not practicing polygamy. Sidney Rigdon was a liar. So he becomes the presiding elder of the small congregation in West Elizabeth, Pennsylvania, which is just on the outskirts of Pittsburgh. But, you know, not too long after that, he becomes a member. And very quickly, this congregation starts to grow. They almost triple their membership with just in a few months. Bickerton was very much a missionary. But not too long after that, you know, in 1851, 1852, Brigham Young is talking with Orson Pratt and they decide, okay, we need to start publicly acknowledging that we do practice polygamy. And they were going to wait to the August of 18, they were going to wait to the August um, 1852 uh, General Church Conference to announce it publicly. But what's interesting and what you learn about with Bickerton, and this was really fascinating that you don't really see in a lot of Latter-day Saint historical literature, is that you know from Bickerton that the Utah church sent missionaries out earlier to kind of spread the word in the East to let people know, hey, polygamy is coming out, just so you know. And they, they just let the higher ups of the church know, like elders and up. So in 1852, in March, I believe, of 1852, they have this meeting in Allegheny City, which is like the north side of Pittsburgh right now. And they call a lot of the people from that area that are like elders and up in the LDS church to basically say, okay, we have this special announcement. And then these, these people from the West basically tell them and say, listen, in, at, at this conference in a few months, we're going to be publicly acknowledging that we have been practicing polygamy. And William Bickerton is shocked because he was told this whole time you, they weren't practicing it. So he actually gets up in the middle of the meeting. He, he says something along the lines of, if the approval of God were to come to me by accepting the doctrine of polygamy, I would prefer the displeasure of God. And he basically just walks out of that meeting right then and there. And he, that's his, that's his uh, leaving of the LDS church. Because he was told from the very beginning they weren't practicing polygamy. He was, for lack of better words, pissed. He was very, very mad. So now, I mean, you can imagine poor William is like, his head is just, you know, everything's spinning, right? Because Signe Rigdon had failed. Brigham Young had failed. They're all liars, right? So he has to reevaluate all this stuff, right? So, I mean, under William, under Brigham Young, he would have had to at least given the idea or at least played with the idea of this idea of eternal exaltation, this idea that you basically can become a god in the la you know, when you die. That was not something that Sidney Rigdon had preached on, but he would at least had to have believed in or at least consider that. And under Sidney Rigdon, they did believe in baptism for the dead. And that was something that, you know, that B B Bickerton was perfectly fine with agreeing with. But here's the problem. Polygamy is completely interchanged or interlocked with eternal exaltation and baptism for the dead. They're all interlinked because polygamy increases your eternal exaltation and you baptize people for the dead so you can increase your polygamous family in the afterlife. I mean, you see, it's all interconnected. So Joseph, so Bickerton's seeing all this and he's seeing that, wait a minute, if you have polygamy, and I know for a fact polygamy is wrong, and he, he, very, he reads that scripture in Jacob very literally that, you know, <laughs> that God does not appreciate whoredoms and people should, man should, a man should not have more than one wife. Well, if polygamy is wrong, then if eternal exaltation and baptism for the dead are interlinked with polygamy, then therefore those three things must be wrong. And he reevaluates everything about the prophetic mantle. And this is what he ends up coming up with. He says, okay, Joseph Smith obviously was the prophet. But because of polygamy and other things like that, he gets killed. God allows that to happen. Sidney Rigdon, he believes, did have a true claim to the presidency. However, Sidney Rigdon goes awry and doesn't do what he's supposed to do. And Brigham Young was an apostate from the very beginning. And 
it's interesting, you know, to kind of see that. So it's very interesting to see that. So he just has to reevaluate all his thoughts. And now he's completely left alone, right? And this is where Bickerton does write about it, saying, I was left alone, didn't know what to do. I have these converts. And by the way, he's the, like, again, he's the presiding elder of this LDS church in West Elizabeth, right? So he eventually goes back to them and has to tell them, hey guys, I had this meeting and this is what they told us. And we don't know what the congregants believed at the time. It's really interesting in their minutes, he actually writes out a thing saying like, we, the undersigned, don't agree with polygamy. And again, this is before the August public, August announcement in the Bicker Tonight Minutes, you see them writing out saying they're practicing polygamy. We don't agree with this. All the undersigned sign here. Well, here's the problem. In those official minutes, the actual like, you know, written minutes that we have, nobody signs their name. So it just leaves us to speculate, like, why didn't they, why didn't they sign their name? Did they want to have like a wait and see approach to kind of see like, well, is it true? Is Bickerton cracking up? Is this all like a joke? Eventually, you know, the August announcement does come out that the LDS church is practicing polygamy. And then eventually those congregants then go back to Bickerton, but he's all by himself. He doesn't know what to do. So he's praying and he says that he has this vision and it, it wasn't more even a vision. It was kind of more like an out of body experience where he says that he was taken up in the spirit and taken to this high mountain. And he says that it was the tallest mountain on the earth. He said that there was just room enough for him to stand. And he basically said that he could kind of like see everything. And he, and then God tells him while he's on this mountain and says like, here, you know, like preach the everlasting gospel you know, or you're going to fall into a chasm. It's actually a very beautiful vision. He says he looks down and sees a chasm, un, you know, below the mountain. And he says the sight thereof is awful. And there's like, you know, there's two main incidents where he writes about this vision. It's in a church publication in of 1863 that eventually when he starts his own church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also colloquially known as the Church of Jesus Christ under him. That's their first official church publication. He talks about that vision quite a bit. And then his autobiography, right before he dies, he does talk about that vision as well. So we have two really good instances, and they're basically both the same thing. It's a really powerful and a very beautiful vision, again, where he believes God is showing him, listen, I know this is hard, but you're kind of like on the highest mountain on the earth. Just keep doing what you're doing. Otherwise, he says, you're going to fall into that chasm. So basically, you know, it's this idea of like, you know, you're going to fall basically where Signe Rigdon and Brigham Young had, fall, had gone if you just don't stay on this, if you, if you don't stay on this path. It's hard, but keep up, keep up at it. So he goes preaching. He's got a small congregation. He's got a heavy burden. He's still working as a coal foreman. He's got to take care of his family, right? He's still working in the coal mines. So that's the best thing to do. If you're working 10 to 12 hours a day, sometimes longer in the coal mines, the, what, what better place to do than to preach? And that's where he starts. He starts preaching to his coworkers and to people that are under him. And he starts getting converts. And he's also in like on Market Street in West Elizabeth, because this is where the ferries would dock from Pittsburgh. And they would, you know, drop off the goods and things like that. So he's literally in the most bustling part of the city you know, of West Elizabeth, where everybody, all the news is happening, where newspapers are dropped off, you know, supplies are dropped off, and he's preaching, and he's gaining converts doing that as well, and very slowly, he starts having these little missions that are starting to grow outside of West Elizabeth, right, all along these little local cities, they're starting to have little congregations, so he actually, again, he was a missionary from the very beginning under Signe Rigdon, had success, he was a missionary under the LDS under Brigham Young was had success like again almost tripled his congregation and now he's having this success as well starting on his own. So what are interesting thoughts about Bickerton and these latter day views and what makes him kind of unique well he believed again in this imminent gathering of Israel. But he believes that in order for that to happen, it has to be the arrival of a choice here. But it's not just like Joseph Smith, a choice here. He believes it has to be a true blue Native American province, literally like a Native American Indian that has to come out from the West and has to like gather, you know, the seed of Joseph that they're called, bring them together. And then the seed of Joseph is going to, you know, be able to gather all the other lost tribes and they're going to all come to somewhere in, in America and they're going to create the new Jerusalem. I mean, this was a very strong concept under William Bickerton. So again, I mean, you can imagine in the 1850s and 60s, there's a guy preaching that the Native Amer that, that you know the America is going to be destroyed and that the Native Americans are going to take over. It's not. I can I can only imagine the eyebrows that that might have raised among some Americans. I mean, again, especially because people did not have good views of Native Americans back that time. 
And also William Pinkerton never agreed with slavery. This is something that's really interesting too. He's, he's very much, I wouldn't necessarily call him an abolitionist, but he's very much believing that, you know, slavery is wrong. Obviously the civil war happens and then the slaves are freed. And from that moment, we see instances, I think the earliest instance I saw in the minutes was I believe in the 1870s, they start ordaining African-Americans in the ministry. They were never barred from any ministerial position. William Bickerton's also ordaining women at this time, which is like, I mean, in the 1860s, he's ordaining women. He's ordaining them deaconesses. So they're not like elders, you know, or, or, or a member of this, you know, an evangelist or something, but they do have an ordained with oil ministerial role that is a holy ordination. And he's getting that straight out of the New Testament. So again, for his time, he was fairly progressive um, quite a bit. So, I mean, as we were, as I was even talking with Barb earlier on, I feel like if William Bickerton would have had a chance to sit down with Joseph Smith III, they really would have had a lot in common. But again, you know, I mean, it's, it's the schisms, right? Everybody's wrong except you. But this is the interesting thing about Bickerton. This is kind of his rocky, this is kind of a quick survey of his rocky road to prophethood. And thank you so much for listening. And I really appreciate it. Here's the shameless plug. If you want to know the whole story, you can get the book and really appreciate all of you listening. Thanks so much. All right. Well, with that, we will draw our program to a close. Thank you again, Daniel, for sharing about William Bickerton. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was great having you here. And thank you to Barb and Peter for helping out behind the scenes. And then last of all, most importantly, thank you to all of you who have participated in the lecture tonight and who just are amazing in your support of Community of Christ Historic Sites. All right, so we have another lecture coming up next week, so I encourage you to tune in uh, when we welcome Amy DeRogatis and hear the fascinating story of Charlie Douglas, aka Elvira Eliza Field Strang. So it's really intriguing. Uh, you don't want to miss this lecture entitled Charlie's a Gal, Jess James Jesse Strang's first plural wife, Elvira Eliza Field. So follow the link that Peter just dropped in the chat and register for the lecture happening in two weeks. Wait, that isn't two weeks. Happening in one week. Barb, am I wrong? No, I'm right. You're right. Okay. Okay. So yeah, register for it. It's happening next week, November 3rd at 7 p.m. Central. And as our friend Barb Walden would say, until we meet again next week, keep reading your church history and have a good night. Thanks. <laughs>